to have uh, John Deaton uh, present with us tonight. Uh, I get the distinct pleasure of introducing him uh, briefly how I got to know who John was. Um, we were in cryptocurrency together. Woo! <laughs> The SEC uh, sued uh, the company Ripple, and uh, John volunteered to uh, take up the case pro bono, and he managed to put together 76,000 XRP holders, uh, and they, uh, as defendants, so I'm a defendant in the case, uh, and I'm also John's client. Um, but, he, but he essentially won the case. He won the case. XRP was declared not a security by the SEC. So that was huge, and so uh, that's how I got to know John. Uh, at the time that he got uh, the SEC got sued, uh, I was busy with the Union Brew House, and I I uh, I had uh, uh, a lot of things going on. But uh, John stepped up to explain to the XR commu XRP community uh, what uh, was going on in the case, and he really took the lead in it was a big relief to me, so I didn't have to. I didn't feel like I needed to do that. Uh, John, so that's how I got to know John. And then when he, his book came out, I read his book on vacation last November, and I was like, oh my God, he might run for Senate. This is going to be awesome, you know? Now, I'd like to be able to, you know, discuss his background. It's really amazing. I'll go over it briefly, you know? Grew up, uh, oh, maybe we'll do this. A comparison to mine. I grew up on the mean streets of East Weymouth, <laughs> beating House Lane. Uh, John grew up in the, one of the worst neighborhoods in Detroit. Um, and he was faced with uh, some serious choices and, and he made some courageous decisions. And it's all in the book. I don't, I won't, I don't want to go on too long. I want to leave some time for John, but it's really an amazing story. And all along the way through his Marine, service in the Marines, um, and, and becoming an uh, accomplished trial attorney, he's always demonstrated character. Uh, and I think that's the most important thing about John. John is someone you can tell that you could convince of a position. He's open-minded, he's thoughtful, he's courageous, he's willing to take on big tasks. Oh, and that's just, that's just an amazing character to have. And what I've found, when our founding fathers envisioned, if you ever read the Federalist Papers, and I read it a couple of times in college, uh, they were looking for people like John. That's what they thought this country would be founded on. As people who went out, lived their lives in the real world, gained experience, had relationships, and then almost, almost reluctantly go to Washington or some other office to serve people. That's what John is doing, and that's character. That's not Elizabeth Warren, uh, you know, academia, lies on her application. This is, this is someone who's built character through going through that. And, it, and if it's not clear to you yet, it'll be clear to you when you read his book, okay? So John is exactly what we need in Massachusetts. We need a change. This country is going in the wrong direction. Yes. 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 It's time that we took charge started putting people in office that are not, you know, surrounded by, you know, yes people and uh, taking the advice and having their bills written by uh, bankers. So, um, I know, I know, John can, John, John can take it from here, but it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you the next U.S. Senator from Massachusetts, Mr. John. Thank you very much. Listen. Uh, Senior Brewhouse T-shirt for you too. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, listen. Um, tonight, I, I appreciate everybody being Yay! here. Honestly, uh, but tonight really isn't about me. There'll be another time when I win that we can celebrate me. I want to. We're here tonight to celebrate all of you because let me tell you, if I could finance the whole campaign, I would but I can't. If I could knock on every door that needs to be knocked on and, and spread the word myself, I would do it because that's how important this race is. 
Ray's not lying about or exaggerating or not. He's not engaging in hyperbole when he says the country's in the wrong direction. And I'll share a couple thoughts in a minute. But if I could do it alone, I would, but I can't. I'm looking at you right now and telling you without the people in this room, I wouldn't have made the ballot. I made the ballot. Uh, you know, you required 10,000 certified signatures. We got over 14,000. 2,000 more than any other Republican. We did that because of you, not because of me. And, and so it takes people to believe in you uh, who are willing to give up their time, who are willing to give up their money, who are willing to give up their Saturday and knock on doors and do all those things and get signatures at a supermarket, giving up time on their weekend when they could be doing other things. It requires you. So without you, I wouldn't be on the ballot. I wouldn't be standing here. Now, I'll come back to the race in a minute, but let me tell you the moment I knew I would run. And Ray's right. I did come from a, a, a very bad neighborhood. Um, the moment someone asked me earlier, like a, a, the moment it sort of changed in my life. And I'll share that with you. The neighborhood I grew up in, I was six years old. I saw my mother get stabbed. Um, I was the subject of violence for a couple years by a predator in the neighborhood. And uh, my first day of high school, I had a 38 shoved in my mouth and the hammer cocked. Um, and I became a high school dropout, just like everyone else in my family for the first three and a half months. And I was crying one day and my mother saw me crying and she says, John, what's wrong? And I told her that I wanna go to college. In order to go to college, I gotta graduate high school. And my mother said, well, just do what everyone else did in the family. Do what your brother did. Work a few years, when you're 17, I'll sign the papers and you can join the military. That was our ticket out of the hood. That was our ticket out of the inner city. And I said, I, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna join the military like that. I wanna go to college. I need to graduate high school. And I'm, you know, devastatedly crying. And my mother, who is my hero, born into generational poverty, put her arms around me and said, I'm sorry, honey, but that's not for people like us. And that's what poverty does, generational poverty does to people. It strips you of your ambition, it handcuffs your mind, it handcuffs the human spirit. And on that day at 14, I said, I'm gonna break that cycle. I'm gonna break the cycle of a deadbeat father. I'm gonna be a good father if I have children. That was like the pivotal moment at 14 years old. Now you fast forward after the Marine Corps experience, I've been a lawyer in the Commonwealth for two decades representing working families. I thought about getting in this race and I talked to my two oldest daughters, Olivia and Jordan, 24 and 22. And I said, listen, your father is thinking of doing something that he's never done before. He's thinking of not only running for the first time in elected office, but I might as well take on arguably the number one Washington elite in Washington, DC, the most entrenched Washington politician there is in Elizabeth Warren. And they looked at me and said, Dad, you know, you're, you're great at everything you do, but we don't think you can win. And I said, why? Why don't you think your father can win? And they said, because you're too honest, you're too blunt, you will never say something you don't believe in, and you will never sell out. And I looked at him. I looked at my daughters and I said, you just convinced your father to run. Because that can't be the standard in this country. And I think people are ready. And let me tell you, without you, I couldn't win. But let me tell you right now, I would not be running if there was no chance to victory. It's not the widest path. I will admit that. It's an uphill path. But... It is doable. Elizabeth Warren is beatable. Yeah. And there's someone else, and I'm gonna share with you, that knows that I can win. And it's Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> right? My team, I told my team, I said, you can ask Christy, you can ask my ex-wife, you can ask the defense attorneys I go against. I have this knack of getting other people's skin pretty quick. And my campaign said, John, she's never gonna talk about you until she has to, she'll avoid you. The very first day I announced, she started tweeting about me. 
on the biggest political day of the year, St. Patrick's Day breakfast, she uttered my name, making a joke about me. They joked about how I don't have a chance. Let me tell you something. When someone doesn't have a chance, you don't joke about how they don't have a chance. No. Just so you know, I got a call from a friend in Texas, a defense attorney that I go up against in my asbestos cases. We've done business, and he's a Democrat. And he's a Democrat donor. And he called me and he said, listen, man, I got to read something to you. And so he starts reading, and I'm like, what are you reading? He goes, it's an email from Senator Warren, and it's about you. And in this paragraph, she's talking about how I'm a serious threat. I must be taken seriously. She did, full disclosure, go on to say that I'm the threat to democracy and national security, right? So the, the Marine officer who served this country is the one that's the threat to democracy. Not, not the not fraud. Not far left uh, failed policy. So, but the point is, she's worried. Fox Business did a segment on Liz Clayman's show that said, why is Elizabeth Warren so scared of John Dean? Right? We have her attention. What? We have her attention because of people in this room. So I'm not going to lie to you. I never will. It is an uphill battle. But I'm telling you now, I would not put my own money in it. I would not give up the, the time that it takes to run. You know, missing t-ball games of my daughter Layla or stuff like that. The sacrifice that your family takes. The scrutiny when she really gets threatened. How they're going to come after me personally and attack me. I would not do those things if there was not a path to victory. There is a path to victory. And we can retire Elizabeth Warren. But it's going to take people like you in this room. You know, this is just the beginning. There's going to be door knocking events. There's going to be a lot of other things that I'm going to ask you to give up your time and to help me. And I will tell you, if you do, I promise you, each and every person in this room will be at the single best victory party you've ever been to. Because when we retire Elizabeth Warren, it, it will go down as one of the greatest political upsets in American history. Okay, And I just want to tell you from the bottom of my heart, I love each and every one of you in the room, even if I'm not your perfect candidate. I'm telling you, you'll always know where I stand. I will never look you in the face and tell you something that I don't believe in. And I will be a candidate that you can be proud that you knocked on doors or you donated or you got signatures. You have my word on that. Thank you, but there's someone else who needs to say something. Layla? <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you for coming. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. 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 Yeah.